All right. Well, um, good evening again, everybody. Um, just as you all know now, the this diaspora seminar series is being recorded. So if you don't want to appear on the video screen, then please turn your camera off. I think you're all muted anyway. But um, if you want to comment um, or raise a question at any, any point, then please do that in the chat. Um, and one of us will keep an eye on that. And um, we're recording so that we can upload it to our YouTube as soon as we possibly can so that people can catch up if they want to. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm delighted to be here with Joni Willett and four brilliant speakers from um, Keweenaw in the, in the US state of Michigan. Um, we have Jean Ellis, who will be speaking from the Keweenaw Canuick, um, Cornish Cousins, um, Sean Goman, Executive Director of the Keweenaw National Historical Park Advisory Commission. Um, Joe Holt, who's a historian at the Keweenaw National Historical Park. And Mark Rhodes, who is Assistant Professor of Geography at Michigan Technological University. So four really interesting and excellent speakers. We've got presentations, so um, we'll be sh they'll be sharing their screens as we go along. And if it's okay with everybody, we'll save questions to the end of the session because I think they'll all build together quite nicely. So um, Jean and Sean, I think it, you guys are opening up for us if that's okay. I think we are and, and thank you for saying there'll be brilliant, four brilliant speakers. I think there'll be three, but I'm not too sure about the first one. So um, I, what I would like to kind of focus on are the people who were involved with the settlement of settlement, so to speak, of the Keweenaw. And shall we get started? Yeah, can we have control of the, are we able to share? Um, you've all got co-hosting um, right. capacity, so you should be able to share. Okay, great. Oh, there I see it. Yeah. Um, and okay. Okay. Hey, well, we're all pretty familiar yeah. with this particular um, proverb or whatever the journey of a thousand miles begins with a st single step. But with this case, the journey of almost 4,000 miles began with leaving home. Leaving a familiar place to go to an unknown one is not easy. And when Cornish folks began to journey to the Keweenaw, they faced long travel into a different climate and a place that to them was totally Hi. unfamiliar. I'm going out now. <laughs> um, they would be leaving family, friends, and places that they had known for much of their lives. In the Long Winter Ends, Newton Thomas's book about Cornish immigrants in the Keweenaw, this description details feelings about leaving home. They could see the lodge of the hedges that marked off the squares and rectangles of the fields of the parish, fields that they had seen red or yellow with trifolium, green after the spring rains, or swaying with loaded ears of waiting grain. From its height, they looked upon thatched roofs of three villages. They could name every dweller in each of them. Across the valley, crowning its own elevation, they saw the homes bush again, <clears throat> looked at it for the very last time. The last to disappear was the tower of the parish church. Its bells had peeled for the marriages of, of generations and told for the spirits of the dead journeying their soundless ways. Roads and lanes as familiar as the paths of the family gardens they followed with their eyes until they were lost in the far country of a neighboring parish. Again and again, they stopped and looked in silent longing. This was all they wished to see. The rest they would look upon would be England. That did not matter. Again, a look, the last. This was home. Where were they going? Well, if you look at the, many of them would leave from um, Cornwall and go overland to places like Liverpool. And the distance for that was about 350 miles. 
but when the when they left from Liverpool, if you look at air miles today, it's about 3,500 miles. So close to a total of 4,000. But that journey is probably, or those, those, that number of miles is probably deceptive because they took a lot of alternate routes. Some of them would have landed in, on the East Coast of the United States. Some would have landed in New York. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, some would have landed in Canada and gone overland, or they might have gone through the, the Great Lakes. Some might might have landed in New Jersey. Some stopped in Bruce Mines. And I can I point to that? Where's it? Right, Bruce Mines was here. Um, some went as far as was, would go as far as Wisconsin to Mineral Point with the lead mines there, but most of them were headed to the Keweenaw right here. Thank you. Okay. Before we go on, though, I would like to point out something that's going to be important. Where'd the cursor go? <laughs> oh, all right. There we go. It does. It does. Down here was once what was supposed to be the border of Michigan. And that's going to get to be important because of the Toledo War. There's ample evidence that there was a lot of prehistoric copper mining in the Keweenaw, but the copper rush that attracted many Cornish people began around the 1840s into the 1850s. Michigan had become the 26th state of the Union in 1837, following what was known as the Toledo War. Michigan had laid claim to Toledo in a strip of land that according to the Northwest Ordinance would be part of Michigan. But the state of Ohio claimed the city of Toledo in its boundaries. Because Ohio was already a state, it had more political power in Congress, which was inclined to allow Ohio to keep Toledo. Well, what ensued was one of the better wars that ever took place, at least in my opinion. Michigan's hot-headed young governor turned, formed a militia and declared war against Ohio. Well, Ohio got right back at them. And the two forces, Ohio's militia and, and uh, Michigan's militia, were ready to meet. But according to at least a popular, one popular story, they were to meet in a swamp, but they both lost their way and only one shot was fired. That's a good kind of war in my opinion. The net result was that Ohio got to keep Toledo. To console Michigan, Congress gave the state additional land, the Western three quarters of the Upper Peninsula as compensation. Who wants it? Well, would you think that 9,000 square miles would pacify Michigan's inhabitants? Not a chance. As far as most were concerned, the Upper Peninsula was just too cold and had poor farmland. But the word got out about native copper when in 1841, a report from the state geologist, Dr. Uh, Douglas Houghton, showed that Michigan really got the best of the bargain. It had the most valuable timber, iron, and copper country in America. The news of the copper seeking, uh, the news brought a rush of the copper seeking prospectors into the Upper Peninsula in the early 1840s. And copper mining was almost continuous for, uh, for the next 150 years. During that time, engage McKinney, you're going to love this. Uh, during that time, over 12 billion pounds of native copper had been mined to the tune of almost $4 trillion. In contrast with the California gold rush, which produced an approximately $81 million in value in 1852, the Michigan, gold, the Michigan copper rush was quite the thing. So who were these people? Well, in his book, The Cornish in Michigan, Russell Munyagi points 
reports that the 1850 census for Houghton County reported 501 foreign born residents out of 708 people. Of that number, 264 were listed as English. I, I'm sorry, I mean, they still said English and not Cornish. Um, there were, uh, that number included 122 miners and 15 laborers. There were 30 German miners out of 142 Germans in the area and 18 Irish miners out of 59 Irishmen. They brought traces that still remain. Apples are not native to North America. But the seeds of plants that settlers brought with them uh, produced a lot, of, a lot of plants. And now those surviving plants blossom in the spring. And it's, it's beautiful. I mean, it really is. And they make it easy to find where the old mining towns were. The buildings may be gone, but the apple trees and the lilac bushes are still there. What did they find when they came to the Keweenaw? Well, thimbleberry blossoms are also a very important sign of spring. And thimbleberries are vivid red berries um, that, <laughs> excuse me, that can be eaten, which I'm sure was a relief to the folks to know. Thimbleberries are native to native North America, and they won't grow farther south than many other berries do. And while they're not unique to the Keweenaw, the jam from them is highly prized and very expensive. If you notice, here we go again. Uh, well, the Copper Falls Mining Company sign shows where that they are, thank you that they were, um, it was established in 1855. So Copper Falls is not far from Central Mine and the Northwest Mine. And all of them were pretty close together in the early stages. This is a picture of Copper, the Copper Falls Mining Settlement. And this was taken, I think in about 1890. As mining increased, the population grew and grew, and more came from Cornwall and other places. Sometimes they recognized friends. Now, I don't know if anybody's there who can do Cornish dialect. I could do it when I was a little kid. I heard a lot of it when I was a kid, but there's no way that I can do it. Anybody want to try? Well, <laughs> okay, you can read it too for yourselves. But it must have been wonderful to meet people whom you meet up with people whom you knew and feel welcomed and feel as if they were sort of home again. One of the people who, oops, what happened there? Where did Matthew go? So, I think it's after. Is it? Oh, well, it shouldn't be after, but okay. Um, Matthew Wasley, was a, a one of the early Cornish settlers. And you can see that he died here in 1873. His grave wasn't always in the cemetery because his story, his sad story was rather intriguing. While he may have met people he knew when he arrived, he wanted someone who, whom he loved to join him. He saved money and sent for his fiance. She made the journey. But according to local stories, she met someone else on her journey, fell in love with him, and let Matthew know. He committed suicide. And according to tradition at that time, he could not be buried in the hallowed ground was, that was the cemetery. So he had to be buried outside the fence. What's it, uh, the cemetery has since expanded and he's now in the cemetery because it's come out to meet him. But for many, many years, there were artificial flowers put outside his gravestone. And who put up the gravestone? Couldn't have been one of his children. So it's one of the mysteries of the people who came. Would be fun to follow up and find it. Um, okay, there we go. The population did grow and grow and grow. And so by 1910, this graph is for Calumet Township only, but 
Houghton County, which had had what 700 or so people, uh, by that by 1910 there were 88,098 people in Houghton County, including the 32,845 in Calumet Township. And Keweenaw County has separated from Houghton County, and they had 700, 700, 7,156 people. So the population had grown almost 200 times to that of what, what the 1850s. The population was multi-ethnic. I'll, I'll tell you, I keep losing this cursor, but you can see that, that uh, a large proportion of Calumet Township had been born in, in the US, 20,243. And then uh, those born in Finland had recently become the next largest part. But then you can see that England, and again, they didn't differenti differentiate the Cornish, had 2002. So they were the third largest population in terms of place of birth. Okay, so history is really is truly written on the landscape. When Howard Kernow first came to the Keweenaw in about the 1990s to try to rouse interest in, in Cornish heritage, one of the slides of Cornwall he showed reminded us all of buildings near the Calumet schools. And I want to point with my fingers, but I can't do that. All right. Ah, there we go. This this probably looks familiar to some of the, or very similar to the uh, buildings in Cornwall. And then down here, the second picture shows picture, houses from Cliff Mine, one of the largest and most successful early mining ventures. Uh, the, the cliff attracted many from Cornwall and Sean will talk more about that. 150 years, ago, these were company houses, and they were moved to Amique and are now private homes. Now, gosh, okay. Um, here, these are signs in Cameron, over here, and in Calumet, announcing the twinning status of the two, two places. You'll see that there's a slight difference in the background in terms of climate. <laughs> we get a lot of snow. And here, come on. Hmm. I think it is. Okay, there we go. You're so good. Um, here. Anne Trevenin Jenkins speaks about her feelings when she visited Calumet. And I think this, the first four, five lines are what really seem to be really important. A long journey to a strange and foreign place, but then we drive along the, old, the long old fashioned street. At once, we are at home. And as you go farther down, she points out things like old shop fronts, some empty, gaps where some have fallen down, old rusty, rusty iron, the treatise of the past, we could have been in Cameron over Ruth. I am at ease. I met Ann Jenkins when she came to Calumet for the eighth gathering of Cornish Cousins in 1995. And along with three friends that included Moira Tangy, who did so much uh, with the uh, Murdoch House and, and the, um, what, I can't think of what it was called now. Anne knocked on the door of my house in Eagle Harbor, and when I opened the door, I saw a woman who looked very familiar, like many of the women I had known all my wife, all my life. She and Moira both had so much impact on learning about the diaspora and on reviving the Cornish language. So these are still traces of things that we're doing. Um, Keweenaw Kernuwick, the Cornish connection of the Copper Country has worked for the past 30 years to highlight the Cornish heritage of the Keweenaw. Here, two members carry the banner. <laughs> All right, come on. Here's the banner of the Keweenaw Kernuwick in the Pasty Fest Parade. So apple blossoms, lilacs, traces of old mining settlements and gravestones are not the only things that show the Cornish heritage of the Keweenaw. If like the early settlers or Antrevin and Jenkin, you make a long journey to a strange and foreign place, you'll find pasty shops, saffron buns, current cookies and have a cake. 
and if you're lucky, clotted cream. Names like Bryant, Shanaweth, Davy, Kello, Medlin, Pemberthy, Rosemary, Roe, and Treganown may have familiar sounds to you. And we hope that that will make you feel at home. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jean. That's lovely. Um, like I said, we'll, we'll keep questions and discussion to the end, but um, Sean, uh, when you're ready, thanks so much. Okay. Um, so hi. Uh, this presentation um, was created for Pasty Fest, which was last um, weekend. Um, so there might be a, a little bit of redundancy from what Jean was talking about, uh, but uh, we'll see how this goes. Um, my background is in industrial archaeology. I'm a historical archaeologist, and all of my research for the last 15 years has been based on the Kiwana and the copper mining here. Um, and especially the first like 50, 50, 60 years of the industry, and that was heavily influenced by Cornish mining expertise and engineering expertise. So I'm just going to kind of talk about um, that today. Um, why, why the Keweenaw? Uh, the copper here in the Keweenaw is very unique um, on the globe. Uh, this is uh, copper that can be found in its native, almost pure metallic state. At times, especially in the first uh, couple of decades of the industry here, starting in the 1840s on into the 1860s, it wasn't so much mining uh, copper as it was digging around pieces of copper like you can see in the upper right and uh, chiseling them apart into uh, sizable pieces that could be removed from underground. Um, this meant that uh, the industry here um, really requ required expertise um, and adaptations to traditional hard rock mining. Uh, the United States at this point is still very much an agrarian economy in the 1840s. Um, and so they looked abroad for expertise. Um, people from Cornwall were recruited, other mining districts that were developing at the same time, only much farther away, either in the Americas, uh, like South America or in Australia, were also recruiting Cornish, but of course this was much closer. You could come through Canada or through um, Eastern uh, American states and make your way here. Um, one thing of interest in the, the image at the top, this is a map of the United States in 1843. Um, we're very much a frontier up in the north, um, but the Keweenaw isn't even included on the map. It cuts, it, it completely cuts it off. This was very much a frontier area. We needed expertise. We thought who better than to recruit the Cornish, either as mining, uh, miners underground or energy, engineers at the surface, building steam engines and other equipment. Um, the first successful mine that we had in the Keweenaw was the Cliff Mine. Um, this got started in 1845 and then had its first profitable year in 1849. As such, they had money to invest. They could grow their mining community faster and larger than any of the other early uh, companies such as Central, Copper Falls, places that Jean's already mentioned. Um, but this was very much a frontier mining district. Um, and you can see even by 1870, so about 25 years after it started, the, um, boy, that table didn't align very well. Uh, <laughs> the English or the Cornish made up uh, very much a, a large majority or a large portion of the workforce um, also, many of those second generation Americans would have been Cornish as well. Uh, the Cornish, the Clifton, the town associated with the mine had three churches, one for each of the different uh, religious groups. You had a Methodist church, which was by far the more, most ornate on the landscape for the, for the Cornish. There was also a Catholic church for the Irish and Germans and a, and a Episcopalian church for the Yankees um, who uh, managed the mine. Um, the Cornish, when they came here, of course, they brought their mining technology and their expertise, but also their, their mining language here. And we still have 
Uh, those words are still part of the, the common interpretive parlance when um, talking about the mining industry here. Um, of course, mining was done here under the contract system, common place in Cornwall. Mining teams were often made up of families, family members, a brother, a father, and a son doing hand drilling like you can see in the upper picture. Uh, over time, uh, the Cornish were often uh, hired as the mining captains or also surface captains, and you, they would always be distinguishable by their uh, white coats um, and referred to as captain underground. Um, I want to talk about a couple of specific Cornish engineers that came here and had a very uh, large influence on the technology and the practice of copper mining in the Keweenaw in the 19th century. Uh, the first was Nicholas Vivian. Uh, Nicholas Vivian was born in Camborne um, around 1815. Uh, he worked um, at a variety of foundries in the area, I think, and then he, he got his education at the Polytechnic Institute. <clears throat> Worked for a bit in France, in Ireland, in Mexico, uh, eventually um, wound up in Canada. Uh, he was the original engineer, I believe, at the Bruce Mine, copper mine in Canada. Gene had mentioned the Bruce Mine earlier. And his um, business was designing um, and overseeing the installation of compact Cornish style beam engines. So these were the classic Cornish beam engine only on a smaller scale. You can see a couple images of those on the right. Um, and he originally was contracted after the Bruce mine, five years later, he showed up at the cliff mine and was contracted to build two of these engines. These are his exact engines in those images on the right there. They, they're identical, um, but one was built for their stamp mill um, and also one as a hoisting and pump engine. Um, Vivian went on to build about a dozen or design and build about a dozen of these engines up and down the Cumana in the 1850s. So pretty much if you had a mine um, operating at a high production level, you had a Nicholas Vivian engine. Um, but his nephew, Joseph Rawlings, um, who followed him, he was five years behind Nicholas. He came to Bruce Mine in 1850, then followed Nicholas to the Cliff Mine. Rawlings is actually the man who installed them. He oversaw the actual installation of the, the engines that um, Vivian was designing. Um, and he traveled, as you can see, this was over a 10 year period, all of the different areas and mines that Rawlings visited and uh, worked for installing these different engines. Anything that's a vertical engine, any of the black dots, those represent uh, Vivian engines and anything horizontal um, were uh, later additions. Uh, the Americans adopted the horizontal style steam engine quite quickly. And this is a part of the Cornish story in the Keweenaw that um, as America advanced in its industrialization, the um, technologies brought from Cornwall were soon replaced by American company, American know-how, their own designs on things. And you can see over the 19th century how the Cornish influence underground and at the surface started to um, wane over time as America uh, increased in industrialization. Um, Rawlings' biggest claim to fame in the Keweenaw uh, was he designed and drafted the first man engine. So man engines had already been in use in Cornwall for a few decades and in Germany, but for the first two decades of the industry here in the Keweenaw, all miners had to use ladders to get underground. Um, ladders that in the harsh winters here or even in the summers could be covered in ice, um, quite treacherous, quite, quite dangerous. Rawlings had not himself um, been on a man engine, but he understood how they worked and he designed one for the cliff mine. Uh, you can see his sketch that he did for the local paper in 1865, they're on the right. Um, by within about 10 years, the man engine completely replaced ladders and all of the uh, mining companies. But uh, for about a year, the cliff had, um, they were the only ones with this technology and it was kept under lock and key behind large uh, steel doors at the cliff mine. 
Rawlings, um, after his stint at the cliff, he was the, in 1860, he became the lead engineer at the cliff mine up until about 1868. He then worked for a half dozen other mines um, in iron mining regions, as well as the copper mines here in the Keweenaw. He also worked for three different iron foundries, a uh, boiler works, um, he, he was everywhere, um, a vernacular engineer, an itinerant engineer, and he spent 40 or 50 to 60 years in this area um, and, and pretty much had a hand in just about every company uh, going. Um, around the same time that Rawlings leaves the cliff mine in 1868, you start to see a change in this mining district. The early mines like the cliff mine and the Copper Falls that Gene had mentioned started to run out of their copper and they transitioned into ghost towns as we say around here uh, the cliff itself became a picnic spot um, but other mines big mines like the quincy mine and the calumet and hecla which for a time was the largest copper mine in the world attracted workers to their areas and so this area started basically transitioned at this time from a frontier mining district into an industrialized um, mining district. Uh, you can see an image of Calumet and Hecla there and it's a village, it's associated village of Red Jacket at the top of the image there. Um, this is a very different um, picture than what we saw in that painting a few slides ago of the, of the uh, cliff mine in terms of a change from a frontier to a more urban environment. But this also coincided with technological changes. The gravity stamps that the Cornish brought with them here to, the, here to America were soon replaced with steam stamps. This allowed steam to both drive the stamp upwards and downwards, creating far more force than a gravity stamp to crush rock and free copper. Engines, of course, got much larger as well. And the Cornish engineers like Rawlings and Vivian were soon replaced by Eastern trained engineers um, in the Boston area, like Erasmus Levitt, who built the massive engine that you can see in the image at top. The hand drilling and the Cornish contract system of labor, that social system of labor underground, working in three-man teams, bargaining for a monthly contract, was replaced by two-man drills in the 1880s, and then by the 1910s, one-man drills. The skill and the knowledge of mining underground that the Cornish brought with them was replaced with machine power that anyone, you didn't even have to speak English, could be trained on how to use uh, the one-man drill. And you can see in these slides the chain, what technology, um, how that changed labor. Um, the numbers of workers drastically reduced um, over the turn of the century. Of course, the boss, the number of bosses never really changed. Um, and then you can see on the right, the changes in the composition of both the miners and laborers. Uh, you can see how the British slash Cornish in 1870 dominated the uh, miner uh, workforce by 1920. They are still the number one uh, ethnic group underground, but they are joined by Finnish and Italians, none of which were even working here in the 1870s. Um, you can see laborers, the big thing that jumps out here there are no British laborers. The British and the Cornish only mined. They did not work other jobs at the mining companies. But you can just see the demographic changes happening there. Um, and this, this is an image just showing that transition from the frontier mining landscapes into the industrialized community that the Keweenaw became by about 1900. At the top is the central mine. Central was probably the the central location for Cornish ethnicity in the Keweenaw probably had the largest number of Cornish uh, residents and workers by, uh, by proportion in the 19th century. But by the turn of the century, everyone's moving to these other mining districts at the Quincy Mine or at the Calumet uh, Mine. And you can see very uh, how that has also just transitioned the landscape itself and how these uh, communities are designed. Um, what's still left on the landscape, Gene mentioned a few things from the industrial side. Uh, we still have equipment that Joseph Rawlings installed himself um, at the Carp Lake mine in, in Porcupine State Forest. 
here at the upper right. That is a camshaft and some of the hardware and some even some stamp shoes sticking out of the ground from a gravity stamp built in 1860. We still have the some stone architecture at the Delaware mine that's very uh, reminiscent of what you might find in Cornwall. There are the smokestacks, the stone stacks that are associated with Nicholas Vivian's compact beam engines. We have images here from the Northwestern mine and the cliff mine uh, tucked out in the woods of, of, of the Keweenaw. And then as a transition into Joe's talk uh, coming up here, an image of the Methodist church at Central, which is still uh, a place of annual gathering for um, the res the uh, descendants of the residents of Ke uh, uh, Central and, and the Cornish that lived there. So thank you. Um, and I will pass this on to Joe, which means I believe I have to pull up her presentation here. So give me one moment. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Um, I apologize, everybody. I'm unexpectedly working from home today and having um, having to be creative with the technology. So thank you for um, Sean's support here. And, just, um, just let me know when you want me to advance the slide and I'll take care of it. Okay. I will. I still see yours up on the screen. But... And I apologize in advance. There are a few typos in my presentation, but hopefully people are, are not going to look too close. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Joe Holt, and I work for the National Park Service, a federal government agency within the Department of the Interior. Um, and my talk today is going to focus on what we in the National Park Service here at Keweenaw are, are doing to interpret and preserve um, Cornish history through our own efforts, but most importantly, um, through our partners, our partnership network. Um, you can forward, Sean, to the next slide. So again, I'm just going to give a little bit of background on the Park Service for those who might not be familiar with this agency. Um, you might know that the first national park in the world, supposedly, was established in 1872, and that was Yellowstone. Um, and while the law that created that park included the importance of protecting cultural resources, um, history was specifically called out um, in the enabling legislation. Um, but it was primarily nature, you know, that it was preserving. Um, it wasn't until 1906 that sites began to be protected expressly for their historic and cultural significance. And one of the first sites to be protected under the 1906 law called the Antiquities Act was the Grand Canyon, um, which contains important archeological sites related to the Puebloan people, as well as their descendants, the Navajo and, and Hopi nations. But since that time, um, and you can keep clicking, Sean, I think I have a couple of little photos in there that are out of order, but um, talk a little bit or show a little bit about what I'm talking about. Um, but since that time, uh, more cultural and historic sites have been added to the national park system. So think of important places in American history, such as um, Gettysburg and in here, the, the Statue of Liberty National Monument, uh, which was designated uh, in 1924 as a national park unit. The important thing that all of these places have in common is that they have to be um, important to all Americans. They have to be nationally significant um, sites and places and, and stories, not just to a local or regional area. Um, so Keweenaw National Historical Park, uh, the park where I work as a historian, was established in 1992 because of that nationally significant copper mining history that, that Sean has talked about. And, that Jean has introduced. Um, it was designated because like the mining industry in Cornwall and West Devon, uh, the copper here um, and the industry that developed to extract it and process it uh, fueled the American industrial revolution and, and really did change the world. Um, just a word about that copper. Um, as Sean and Jean mentioned, the copper here existed in its pure metallic form and as soon as the glaciers receded from the area several thousand years ago, the indigenous people, you know, who moved into the area following that glaciation, um, made uh, they found copper and they made utilitarian items. Um, if you could click, I think a couple of slides, Sean. Um, yeah, example of pure native copper, and then um, they made utilitarian items like this fish hook here, um, as well as others. Um, 
decorative and, and trade items. But this is the first metal mining and metallurgy in the Western Hemisphere. So the Kiwana story is not just nationally significant history, but I think internationally significant. So each group of people that participated in this industry over time and called this place home from the indigenous Ojibwa so people to the immigrants who came from um, the East, by Americans who came from the East Coast of the US and from Canada across Europe and parts of Asia um, contributed to the creation of a distinctive cultural heritage of this, this region. And this is a, a little clip or a clip, an excerpt from the parks enabling legislation that talks specifically about the importance of ethnicity and cultural heritage to this particular region. And I have a photograph here um, of an, uh, just an example of the, the cultural heritage. This is um, a building called Italian Hall. And um, if you click again, Sean, just an example of, of a cultural practice that Finnish immigrants brought to the area that the Finnish uh, sauna or sauna, as as they say correctly here. Uh, my, my husband is part Finnish and he, he keeps correcting me in my pronunciation. Um, but in this, the Kiwana is, is a pretty typical American story. Um, and I, I don't really like that melting pot analogy or mixed salad, but the, our enabling legislation might be onto something when they talk about this uh, remarkable ethnic conglomerate. Um, and um, so, uh, and I have to say a word about Pasty Fest. I, I hope you all know what we've been talking about when we say Pasty Fest, but it's our annual uh, celebration of Cornish heritage and culture and the Pasty here in, in Calumet. Um, so at the, the park here works in partnership with a variety of organizations uh, to interpret this and preserve the history here, including our co-legislated partner, the Advisory Commission that Sean is representing as the executive director of today. And so we work not just within our, our park boundaries, which were designated kind of around two areas in the central part of the peninsula, but across this, this district here from the top of the peninsula in the north, up at Copper Harbor and Fort Wilkins State Park, down to that green blob there in the bottom left, which is the Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park, and 22 different sites stretching along that that. Um, th throughout the historic mining district. Um, each of them are independently owned and operated. Some are, are even for profit industries, but they're all part of this um, Kiwana Heritage Site Network that works with the park. And I've included the little miners logo um, where you can, if you ever visit, you'll see that logo marking all of our Kiwana Heritage Sites. Um, and um, so the park provides a traditional park experience kind of in our facilities, but also we've been mandated to provide technical and financial um, assistance um, to, to these sites, you know, as to preserve and, and interpret their stories. And next slide, Sean, uh, we're coming back to um, the Central Methodist Church that's come up a few times in, in our program already. Um, it's built in 1868, and as a, the speakers have mentioned beforehand, it's a very important location for Cornish history in the Keweenaw at the Central Mine. Um, here's an example of, of where the park, our historical architect, um, has provided guidance for maintaining this, this wooden structure. Um, and also we've provided funding to make sure that it stays um, in good shape and usable. Every year it hosts an annual gathering um, of Cornish descendants and, and um, other people who are interested in preserving and, and celebrating Cornish culture here. Um, next slide, Sean. Um, this is also at Central, but it's a photograph showing the National Park Service youth crew, our, our summer uh, teenage crew, um, helping with landscaping at Central. And then if you click, there's a photograph of the Powder House at Central where the Park Service's masons have helped with ruin stabilization. Um, it, and all of this to help interpret the lives and, and work of Cornish immigrants in the 1850s and 60s at, at this, these early sites. Um, next slide. Um, this is still at Central. I, I just, uh, I love this photograph, um, even though it might be kind of hard to interpret on your screen, but it's um, a structure close to the, the church there at Central. But just help um, I, showing how the Park Service can help our partners interpret the, the Cornish immigrant experience here. Um, next one, Sean. This is the one I thought was gonna come up next. 
But I, this is a, an example of how we interpret the Cornish experience specifically in the context of this multi-ethnic community here at our visitor center. Um, if you look closely at that image, you'll see it's expressly requesting Cornish um, miners to come to work in Calumet, um, definitely recruiting. And the interesting thing is that this poster dates to 1895. So even at that late um, year, um, there is a call for skilled Cornish miners to come to the, to the Keweenaw. And exa another example of our um, the way we interpret the Cornish is, of course, the pasty there. Um, it's in one of our exhibits at our visitor center. But because Cornish immigration is such a big part of the story here, um, I got curious about how emigration is interpreted in Cornwall. Um, especially thinking about the World Heritage Site there with, with its network of partners, uh, which is so similar to the park model, just on a larger scale. Um, and so next slide, Sean. Um, a colleague and I got to visit in 2019, right before the pandemic, and we visited a number of spots, but one that really stuck out for us was Giver. You can ignore the label thing. Um, Oh, I think that was actually it is accurate. There's one that has a, an incorrect label, and I apologize if anyone's seen that, and I haven't called it out. But anyway, back to Giver. Um, what caught my eye there, in addition just to the fabulous interpretive experience we had there, learning about the mine, and, and there was a little exhibit. Um, next slide um, about um, emigration. The exact thing I was interested in looking in. We almost walked past it and didn't see it, but imagine our surprise when we realized that these postcards in the exhibit. Um, were addressed to someone in Calumet and in Lorium, our neighboring community. Um, and just these towns are really at the heart of Keweenaw National Historical Park. Um, but they were sent to an E. Jerish or Garish. I'm really hoping someone can correct my pronunciation of that surname. Um, one was sent to a post office box um, in Lorium in 1904 and one to a house in Calumet in 1909. And I came back, um, if you can click there, yeah, um, and did some preliminary research. And there's a really interesting historical GIS system that I used to see if there was anything that came up on this particular address. And sure enough, there was a small bit of information talking about Edwin Garish or Jerish. Um, so I knew he was a miner. Um, and then um, found the house that it was addressed in. So if you can forward, there it is. Yeah, this house here on the right, um, the gray house is number one Ash Street where E. Jerish, Edwin Jerish lived. Um, it was built by the Tamarack Mining Company right next to the Calumet and Hecla Mining Company that um, if you might remember Sean's image of the Calumet and Hecla community, Tamarack was, was right next to that settlement. It was established in 1882. Uh, the Tamarack Mining Company built this row of houses and, and others in this neighborhood. Um, they built a hospital, a Methodist church, and a school, um, all of which have been lost, but these houses remain. I don't know who else lived in the house or if he was a boarder or if he rented it. I don't know how long he stayed in Calumet, but it appears that he made multiple trips back and forth to Cornwall, um, and he also recruited others to come to Michigan. And I think his experience reveals that that mid 19th century Cornish emigration experience that both Sean and Jean talked about continues into that late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, although by that time, um, Edwin and his fellow Cornishmen were arriving in a much more diverse community and a much different mining industry. But there's lots of different questions. I still am asking about this, this gentleman and, and how the postcards ended up back in Cornwall and in an exhibit at Giver um, part of me feels like he must have, you know, come to Michigan, made a lot of money or made some money and went back to Cornwall, but I don't know yet. So I would love to go back to uh, Chris and Carnell and to see what I can find there. But um, it's just an example of how much more research there is to do and how many more stories there are to tell and how many more connections there are to make. So thank you. Thanks so much, Joe. That was a lovely presentation and also Sean's before that. Um, so much to dig into there and think about, but we will carry on if that's okay. Over to Mark, who is our last speaker this evening. You're great. Good. Yeah. Um...
think. All right. Are you seeing the full screen or the presenter view there? Full screen. Great. Excellent. I never know what the double monitors and all of that. Great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, trying to wrap up uh, three great talks here. Um, uh, kind of continuing on with what Joe was talking about. I'm uh, Dr. Mark Rhodes. I'm Assistant Professor of Geography at Michigan Tech, um, where we have uh, a master's and PhD program in industrial heritage and archaeology. Actually, Sean Goldman is a product of that program from quite a few years ago. Um, and so my interest is really looking at the institutions of industrial heritage, sites like the Keweenaw National Historical Park and the Cornwall and West Devon Mining Landscape World Heritage Site. And so I want to spend a little bit of time digging even further into what Joe kind of hinted at there of the really remarkable connections that we have, not just in the, the narratives and the diaspora and the technology and the history of the sites, but in actually how we've preserved these sites today um, and some of the geographies. And just to give a little bit more background um, on the uh, Cornish side of the industrial heritage, we're talking about a, a world heritage site um, inscribed in 2006, um, also kind of spread across the peninsula here. That's uh, 10 different areas across the Cornish Peninsula, uh, mostly in Cornwall County, but also in West Devon Borough Council. Um, and administrated uh, across, well, managed by the Cornwall County Council, but administrated um, and overseen um, by a, a number of different political units. Um, and as uh, now, I think it was Joe, maybe Sean, was talking about, you know, any of our national parks in the United States has have to demonstrate national significance. Well, now we're talking about the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, that designates global world uh, world significance. Um, universal outstanding value is the kind of term that, that's used in the designation, designation of world heritage sites. And so criterion two, three, and four have all been met um, when this was an ascribed site. Criterion two is connected to that human story, the diaspora itself, and the impact that that had globally from the Cornish miners leaving um, and taking their, their skills and their cultures with them. Um, the criterion three is more focused on the cultural tradition that that stayed and that emerged out of these mining communities in Cornwall. And then criterion four is the technology itself and the landscape, such as the 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 beam engines and um, the 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 lasting smokestacks and kind of the you know as you can see in the logo of the Cornish Mining World Heritage Site there the the technology that's still very much present on the landscape in Cornwall just as um, Everyone has been talking about this technology left on the landscape here in the Keweenaw. And just to kind of get into the administrative kind of how how, how is our national park layout here, um, it, it's a bit uh, confusing because there are multiple uh, aspects. And this is just an infographic I created for something else. And it's, it's actually outdated now because there are 17 uh, of these heritage sites plus the three historical societies, plus the two uh, units directly underneath the National Park Administration. But these other heritage sites are underneath the, oh, you're not seeing my mouse. My mouse is here, sorry. Uh, these other heritage sites are underneath the Keweenaw National Historical Park Advisory Commission, which is what Sean uh, is the executive director of, and, and Joe is working within uh, the National Park Administration um, on the other side here. And so collectively, these units, these sites, um, variously owned and operated, also scattered, and I'll kind of go on to the next slide here, scattered, as Joe was saying, across the entirety of the Keweenaw Peninsula, um, are managed at a number of different ways from a number of different parties, just like uh, in Cornwall here. And this is, you know, as a geographer, I should really have made a better map here, and I really just kind of flipped and did some copying and pasting, uh, but I wanted to scale um, and kind of show you the comparison of these two peninsulae uh, at scale. Um, so not only are they roughly the same size that you can see here, um, but the, the industrial heritage site itself is spread 
almost remarkably similarly across the peninsula. And that comes down to the geography of these extractive industries themselves in a lot of ways, right? We're not talking about a singularly bound Yellowstone National Park or Dartmoor National Park, right? We're talking about a national park or a world heritage site that has to, to follow where the mining companies that were not collectively owned, right? These were independently competing mining companies following these loads uh, as they found them across the peninsula. Um, that combined with the kind of role of politics and the role of economics of which communities need industrial heritage and welcome industrial heritage to maybe offset deindustrialization that both of our peninsula uh, face. Um, and, and then you get this kind of very disparate geography of industrial heritage. Um, and I, I don't think I have to talk a whole lot about this, right? The the role of the Cornish emigrant in this narrative, right? So not just the the kind of physical geography, but the, the narrative the, of the World Heritage Site, as Joe was talking about at, uh, at Giever, most of these pictures are at Heartlands and Poole. Um, you know, the narrative is so much rooted into that criteria too, that diaspora, the impact um, of the, the the Cornish um, emigrant leaving and and influence having influence around the world. You can see again the the twinning town that that Jean was talking about uh, and the picture. Um, and you know, just from this one map here, we have um, several points that are even you know, overlapping so much you can't even see them in the Keweenaw. You have Keweenaw listed, but then Calumet is listed. Mohawk is on the peninsula. Houghton is on the peninsula. Um, Sean mentioned Cliff Mine, which uh, you can see uh, images of and uh, two different uh, panels at, the, at heritage sites here. And so again, it, these are representative of the narrative across the world heritage site of of the the Cornish diaspora and the Kiwana is a part of that, but not um, you know not everything is right. It, it's this global picture um, that we're talking about here, and so I'm really interested more in the you know what kind of questions of sustainability do sites heritage sites such as these, particularly industrial heritage sites such as these, face when they're faced with geographies such as these, right? Differing um, ownership, uh, the actual like physical space of, of, of managing a site that's discontiguous, um, of being in a, a very rural area here. Um, to those of us in the US, there's not much in the UK that is rural, but I know to most people in uh, in Britain, Cornwall is relatively rural. Um, and so what are the challenges to physical mobility in every sense of that word on these industrial landscapes? Um, when you don't have a centralized core of a heritage site, it's much harder to, to create a, 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 you know, a, a, a landscape that someone who has ambulatory um, concerns to, to be able to act physically move around in. But also both of our peninsula are facing challenges from over tourism, um, not from our industrial heritage, but from the tourism that our peninsula uh, attract because of our coastlines, because of our outdoor recreation. Um, and so already we are facing infrastructure challenges because of the rural nature of these sites. Um, and so how can we think about um, managing industrial heritage and, uh, and using industrial heritage for much needed economic regeneration in some cases, um, while not exacerbating problems that are already um, being faced in some of these towns that are they're seeing over tourism and, um, you know, environmental impact and um, simple like space as far as parking and um, 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 noise and, and other things such as that. And then finally, what what about the, the heritage itself? So yes, um, diaspora is, is a major narrative across all these um, sites in uh, these areas in the World Heritage Site, um, but is everyone's story being told uh, in the way that each community wants it to be told. We're talking about dozens of villages and towns in both of our uh, peninsula here, right? That, that are trying to have their story told in a singular park, a singular site. Um, and that's 
really hard to do um, from from a, a singular narrative. And so, what is the role of that overarching unit, that overarching park, the over you know the Cornwall Council, um, whoever it might be that's managing? these interpretations to be able to allow communities to tell their own stories, um, even stories that might be competing or, or contradictory, um, but also to be able to step in and, and point out stories that aren't being told in industrial heritage. You know, the role of women, the role of um, immigrants that, uh, that, you know, particularly uh, Afro-Caribbean immigrants or um, Black immigrants in the United States, for instance, um, or um, colonialism, right? In both of our peninsula uh, are connected intimately with, with empire in very different ways. Um, these are stories that don't often get told in industrial contexts, but that is also changing, again, what's the role of the central heritage site uh, to that space. And so what I uh, um, did and, and my, my co-author um, assisted uh, with me, and I think Catherine is on the call, um, uh, we both spent uh, about a week and a half in Cornwall visiting stakeholders um, of uh, heritage sites within these areas, primarily museum directors, heritage site owners, um, people who are, are directly working in industrial heritage sites within these areas um, and ask them quite simply to map the boundaries of what they thought the world, you know, we asked them to please draw the boundaries of the World Heritage Site. Um, and, and this is what we we uh, got from the all of the respondents kind of collated together in the mental maps. And, and we're, this is still kind of a work in progress. I'm working on trying to make these maps a little bit more clear. And, and there's a couple actual errors that I need to fix. And so I haven't been able to share these. This is the first time I think I've really been able to share these. Um, but there's still information that, that we can glean from this data um, that's really interesting. So A, the World Heritage Site is the, this, this entirety of you know, these 10 areas, but there's very clearly a heart to this heritage site. And some towns, such as Red Ruth and Camborne, embraced that, right? The, you know, if you've been to Central Red Roof, you, you'll see this giant banner. I mean, this is a 12-foot tall um, kind of welcome, welcome sign in, in Central Red Roof. And they are at the heart of Cornish mining. And that reflects on how people perceive the World Heritage Site, um, which is you know, part of the development strategy, the tourism strategy of Red Roof and Camborne, trying to attract in those tourists that, that concentrate on the coasts of Cornwall. Um, but again, what are kind of some of the implications of that? And you know, where does the the West or the, the, the East, in this case, West Devon, come in? You can see kind of an isolated West Devon um, where not too many people are are indicating these these far um, eastern areas of the World Heritage Site. And you can even see from a, a bit of a uh, uh, challenge to the logo itself, right? Where Cornish mining. World Heritage Site to the Cornwall and West Devon World Heritage Site as its official title. And the Cornish Council actually had to um, develop a second logo for some sites, not all sites, but some sites in West Devon who um, felt left out from the narrative of Cornish mining. Um, and so again, this disparate geography um, has a lot of potential to it, but also has a lot of challenges when it comes to actual management and narratives that are told. Um, even, you know, again, this isn't uh, just anybody. This isn't just a random survey off the street. These are museum directors. And so there's there's um, a, kind of a, a interesting perspective there. And a lot of this draws back on work of Matthew Leish at Central Michigan University, who's done work in the Keweenaw. And he didn't do any mental maps, physical mental maps, but he did an ethnography of our Keweenaw National Historical Park. And he's found kind of a similar response from people, not museum directors, but people just being completely unaware that there's a park at all, which 
is very also clear that it happens in Cornwall that people don't know that there's this World Heritage Site. Um, but from the directors themselves and from people who are involved with uh, the advisory commission to people who are involved with the National Park to um, people involved with the Industrial Heritage Program here at Michigan Tech, um, ranging from everything from the, the National Park is simply you know, Calumet and kind of the, the park headquarters downtown um, to all of the peninsula, um, regardless of where the official boundaries might be. Um, and so kind of returning to world heritage, um, another question we asked was, well, what's the impact of this world heritage? Like, what's the purpose of this world heritage? And most people responded with uh, the idea that it's, it's, pretty much a stamp, right? It's this this marker of approval. It's it's a, a marketing device. Um, you'll notice funding is not mentioned anywhere in these responses. This is kind of a collate response of the 18 uh, people that we ended up interviewing. Um, and funding's not connected to UNESCO, right? You don't get any funding for being a World Heritage Site. You can you know secure other funding maybe with that title, with that... Um, you know, having that status, but it does not guarantee any additional funding simply for being a World Heritage Site. Um, and so one interesting aspect is as the Cornwall Council has had drastic budget cuts over the years and, and, and funding you know, due to austerity, um, fewer and fewer pounds are able to find their way into the heritage sector um, through public funding. Um, and so what used to be the CMAMA, the Cornish Mining, sorry, the glare, the Cornish Mining Attractions Marketing Association, um, what used to be this uh, conglomeration of mining attractions across Cornwall, um, very much in the same kind of structure, loose cooperative structure as the um, Q1 on National Historic Park Advisory Commission, um, right? All independently owned, but kind of cooperating and sharing resources in a way, you know, this, this went away um, during kind of the height of funding and access from Cornish Council. But once that funding has started to dry up, um, most of the people we spoke to are actually thinking about trying to go back to something like this now that the, the central resources aren't there. And so there's there's some things we can really learn, I think, across, across our two um, industrial regions. And one is the, the value of you know, an organization such as Sean's, um, the, the advisory commission of being able to maintain uh, connections and resources across these disparate sites, these disparate geographies, um, even if, and I'm sure this will never happen, but even if our National Park Service was suddenly overfunded uh, and <laughs> they had plenty of money and maybe you know a commission wasn't needed anymore, um, I think we have a great story from Cornwall that you know we should put every effort in making sure those connections stay because when we're thinking about sustainability, that funding won't stay there forever. Um, but we can see all these different shared stories, right? From the migration technology and industry um, towards the economic decline of both of our regions and the turn towards tourism and industrial heritage. Um, but just as, you know, much as heritage and history and the past is important and, and certainly a passion of mine, I think everyone here, um, our heritage sites aren't about the past as much as they are about telling these stor stories and helping us learn and shape our futures, right? These are about preserving these sites and telling these stories and sharing these um, perspectives and stories for the future. And so just as much as there's shared challenges and kind of learning that we can do across our two peninsula, um, there's also possibility. And I think this, this talk is, this kind of event is, one of these uh, examples of a possible you know, shared future and, and learning from each other and continuing forward in that way. And that's, uh, that's all I got. Thanks so much for that, Mark. Honestly, what a brilliant presentation to end these four, um, these four talks on. We've all touched on so many, so many different aspects and it's all been so interesting there's a lot of um thank yous in the chat to say um thank you to each and every one of you for your presentations and some mentions on family histories 
um, which might be interesting for um, for you guys if you're interested in looking at these. Um, if you if there are comments or questions to put in the chat, um, please do that. I'm sorry if you can hear my computer wheezing; it's a little bit old. Um, so, uh, yeah, just fascinating. And I had a couple of questions. Um, but it's just before that, it's so interesting to see these commonalities between Cornwall and Coina, whether that's the literal rocks beneath our feet, um, the transfer of technical language and terminology and expertise, architectures, culture, religion, and obviously the, the more important, the all important pasty. So um, I wondered, Jean, if, if you would mind um, just spending a second telling us about the Pasty Festival because um, I've never been and I'm sure there are people here who haven't and would love to hear a little more about that given it's been such a recent event. Well, shall I tell you about the most important thing about the Pasty Fest? It used to be that the parade was led by Toivo, the walking pasty. And thank you to the Keweenaw Care Newick, which I'm representing today, we objected because we said Toivo is Finnish and that's not fair. So the people who were at the time arranging Pasty Fest said, well, okay, we'll, we'll do a vote. And they put canisters around where you could buy a vote for a dollar. Well, let me tell you, Cousin Jack the Walking Pasty won hands down. <laughs> so Cousin Jack the Walking Pasty is now what who leads the parade. But they didn't have a parade this year. So Pasty Fest, I think, gives everybody, well, you, you know probably a, a lot about it too. It gives everybody a chance to uh, sample different pasties. Um, there are lots of different musicians around. They have a they have different entertainment for children. They have people who have local crafts and um, various different things. Uh, there were, oh, I have to tell you the story. There's a wonderful story about um, the fact that the pasty in some ethnic groups has been adapted to have a lot of carrots in it. And that's not fair at all. So a few years ago, there were there was a group of people, one dressed as a complete pasty, one dressed as the meat, one dressed as a rutabaga, one dressed as a carrot. I think there was one as an onion and then potatoes. And consistently the rutabaga, the Swede, would beat up on the carrot. So it's in good fun, it really is. And it's a wonderful day. And I think, I don't know what more I can tell you about it. No, that, that's lovely. Thanks, Jean. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, we, Joni's asked in the, in the chat if you might be able to say a little bit more about Cornish women who migrated over to the Keweenaw. It's something I actually had in mind to ask because obviously we talk about mines and miners and it's such a male dominated industry that um, it would be lovely if you could talk a little about um, what life was like for women and families um, in the area if, if you could. Well there, there are a lot of things to talk about various different women. Um, there was a fuse factory for example in, in Eagle River um, run by a family named Light. And um, the woman who was able to work with her husband who was a carpenter to, de to develop the machines um, was according to, according to her family, she was the brains behind it. So Mary Terrell Light had been a ball maiden in Cornwall. And at the age of eight, she was living with her grandmother uh, and working in, near one of the mines. She eventually left working at the mine um, and 
started working in a fuse factory and managed to get her way around the various different machines so that she knew how they functioned. When they came here, she and her husband lived, I believe, at Copper Falls or Central. And they weren't really sure which. And they, he, he was a carpenter, so he built the machines out of wood. And they had them going through their house from the downstairs to the upstairs and then back down again. And eventually, I think they had eight different machines that produced fuses in, in Eagle River and became quite well-off people, no question about it. The other thing that still irritates me, um, one of the, my great-great-grandmother left Cornwall with four children after her husband died and they came here, they, they settled in Pennsylvania. Long story, she ended up in order to help part of her family, she crossed the continent at least twice, ended up living here, was clearly the mainstay of her family for years and years. And I was trying to find out where she was buried because she was 89 when she died. And it turned out that she indeed was buried in a local cemetery. But to try to find her gravestone was a real challenge. And when I found it, I didn't know what I was looking at because all it said was mother. She didn't have a name. She simply had a role. She has a name now and she has some more other things on her gravestone. Women generally, I think, did not get the credit that they should have for what they, what they did. And I like to quote a verse in a poem poem that I wrote that says, um, the miners brought their shovels when they started their new lives, but the pasty that came with them was the gift of Cornish wives. I think we need to know more and more about what these women did. And I think we find a great deal that, that, that they did a great deal. Thanks so much, Jean. That's marvellous. Um, there have been a couple more comments uh, in the chat um, about Cornish history. Um, so somebody with an iPhone is asking, is there a role for, a, for the Cornish diaspora in helping with the issues of teaching Cornish children about Canuic, the Cornish language, and of Cornish history. I'm not. I'm sure each of you probably have a probably have some thoughts on that question. Um, I don't know if you want to jump in on that. Um, maybe one to think about. But also, while you were talking, Jean, about um, about women and the role of women in the Kiwan, or um, made me think of you know children and and families also and. A question that might be equally for Sean or Joe or Mark. Um, I wondered if there were opportunities to sort of learn the trade and become experts in mining locally in the Keweenaw. Um, you know, I've come I've come across schools of mining set up in other um, sort of uh, industrialized places, and wondered if there were if there was anything similar in, in your area. Do you mean for women or, or oh, just I meant, I meant overall? In, I meant overall. Oh, well, Michigan Tech. You currently? Mark? Yeah, but historically and, and in, in to now, I was intrigued as just to, you know, you have the expertise coming over with the migration, um, but did that develop into a schooling program, for instance? Yeah. Mar yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah so, um, Again, I, I, I meant to actually mention this. Um, so Michigan Technological University used to be called the Michigan School of Mines. Um, we were established in 1885. I'm pretty sure uh, that's, but, but we were established to train um, of mining engineers. Um, and we still do actually. Um, we, it's the, the engineering school is still the, the majority of our university. Um, but but that's also why we have the industrial heritage program here, right? All of these things kind of have connected in 
uh, to one another. Um, the, the Quincy mine still has a classroom um, in it. Uh, there's one that's for uh, uh, demonstration, but uh, apparently this year, and maybe Sean can talk about if, if you were aware of this more or Joe, uh, apparently this year they're starting to, to bring glasses back into Quincy mine from Michigan Tech. Yeah, there's a blasting class where they learn how to drill and then blast mine rock. But yeah, the, you know, the establishment of the Michigan School of Mines goes hand in hand with kind of the, the changeover of the kind of vernacular expertise that was brought over from Cornwall to the professional expertise in the school room that kind of signified uh, Calumet and Hecla, the, the mine office building, which we're sitting in right now um, as well. But that definitely there's uh, that, that story is part of it. I think also way back, the uh, mining companies, at least CNH, encouraged the idea of, of um, industrial arts that would be related to mining and some of the rest of that kind of thing. But that, and they still have different robotics and things like that, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know if they have anything to relate to mining. Well, the massive school that, the building we're next to, uh, Calumet School, uh, had, you know, it was designed to train future miners and future workers for the mine. Um, it still had practical trades training up until really quite recently, some of which, if I remember, Joe was linked with the National Park at one point. That was an idea to do that, but I don't know that it ever actually happened. But um, thinking about like a mining school, <clears throat> excuse me, I it's um, my, my first initial thought was, you know, the National Park Service is about resource preservation, and I think mining is inherently destructive, <laughs> so we might have an interesting conversation about where to teach people or where to, you know, um, or to help people learn that skill, even if it was at one of our partner sites like Quincy, you know, just a, just a thought, but could you, this is a little bit off topic, but you'll have to pardon me. I'm, I'm not feeling well, but my mind also went to the work that, that Carl Blair is doing with indigenous kind of the early mining methods. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if there could be a link um, to that. Sorry, thinking out loud, but. I flummoxed you both. <laughs> I just recently, and this has nothing to do with what Jill's talking about, but I just recently finished the Saffron Bun Chapel, which was interesting to read um, with different ideas about mining. And that's, you made me think about it, Jill. Um, I, I'm not sure, I don't know enough about indigenous people to know whether or not that was an, that the attitude that's portrayed in that book is ac accurate, but it, it was quite interesting. And having known Alan Kent, it was fun to read the, the book. Uh, that would mean more to the people in Cornwall than it, than it would to the people here. But um, it, was, it, it was interesting to read it. I wish it, wish it had better or bigger print because I have old eyes. <laughs> and I was trying to, respond to something in the chat. And I think I missed whatever you asked, Joe. So if that was directed to me, I'm sorry. I was trying to reply to something. I might be able to reply. Um, so so you brought up Carl Blair's archeological field school uh, um, this past summer. And uh, they've they've found just this past summer evidence of not, I mean, we've known for quite a while now of the extent to which um, indigenous peoples um, were mining um, this region. I mean, the, the copper trade, you know, we found uh, Keweenaw copper in, you know, Cahokia, uh, which is another World Heritage Site, uh, in Illinois, uh, the East Coast, um, as far south as, as uh, uh, the Mayans. Um, but um, just this summer, uh, Carl Blair, who's an uh, archaeologist here, um, they've discovered um, 
that indigenous people were mining into conglomerate uh, and not just finding that float copper uh, and, and kind of hand working it, um, but but hot working as well. And I'm not an archaeologist, so um, that's about all I can relay from what he has been telling me. <laughs> you scroll up in the comments. That's absolutely fascinating, just you know, how I was amazed that's to it. hear that I read that, the, that there was indigenous um, metal working, but I had no idea one of you mentioned it was the oldest uh, metal working in the Western Hemisphere or similar. That was quite extraordinary. Um, I'm scanning the chat to see okay. if we've got any more questions. And if anyone wants to put their hand up and ask, you're um, really welcome. Um, I'm just checking if there's anybody. I'm looking at Mike Kiernan's comment, was Grass Valley really the most Cornish town in the USA or was it Mineral Point? I bet some places in Michigan can also make that claim. Oh, I, there it was, yeah. There's a little bit of an argument about that. I think there was a whole presentation or a, I think there was an, an effort in Milwaukee to try and build on, the, <laughs> on mm. that as a rivalry kind of thing maybe make some money by voting. <laughs> so no, no comment on that one. <laughs> um, I, I had uh, just another question really for the room, but um, I don't want to trespass too much further on everyone's uh, afternoon or evening um, because we're past eight o'clock now, but um, you talked a lot between you about the the commonalities that that the Keweenaw and Cornwall share. Uh, they're quite extraordinary, even you know the peninsula situation and um, you know just the geography. Um, and as you were coming to your final slide, uh, Mark, I was typing a little question down, which was, "What do you think are the main shared challenges facing Cornwall and the Keweenaw as heritage sites?" And then that was pretty much the title of your last slide. Um, how do you think we might, What? where do you see opportunities for working together to kind of over, overcome some of those shared challenges? Yeah, um, I, I think, so it's interesting and I, I'd like to hear, I mean, I'd like to hear Sean and Joe's thoughts as well as being connected and gene all three of you are in various ways connected to the national park um as heritage site director or commission director or historian um but you know the 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 national park is quite a bit older than the world heritage site um and so it, it, it's would be interesting to look at the way in which we have been successful and you know if we have been successful in creating this kind of community around industrial heritage here which i think also exists in cornwall um, but there's not nearly as much connection across the heritage sites in the world heritage site um that that i've seen in cornwall um they're there but it's very very loose compared to you know uh, the 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 monthly commission meetings, or I, I, maybe it's every other month. I I don't know how often you're Quarter. meet quarterly, quarterly quarterly commission meetings with the National Park Service, and um you know an established grants program, and and you know it, there's really kind of tight connections between the heritage sites in the Keweenaw that I don't see in in Cornwall, um that that might be due to age, but also I think it's part of that, you know, the the loss of the Sea Mama organization in Cornwall, whereas the commission has kept going in the Q&A. Um, but, but vice versa, you know, you know, just, and Joe can price peak to this. I don't know if you took public transit, but I don't, I don't rent, I don't drive in the UK. I can't do the uh, other lane. Um, <laughs> I take public transit everywhere. And it's just, you know, having, you know the the tin coaster. I mean, and and particularly last summer, or not this not this summer of the past summer, where there was a the Cornwall Council put the five pound flat rate 
on public transit for the day. I mean, that that's just, um, you know, I would die to have something like that, <laughs> even even a, a fraction of something like that in the QAnon to allow public transportation of not just tourists, but but local residents so that we can be able to visit our sites more easily. Um, I, I think so th there's th those are probably the two the two biggest things as far as like Cornwall seems to have figured out the infrastructure, not with with tourism necessarily, because I know some of your towns are just you know overrun in the summer with with tourists. Um, but but as far as with other aspects of the infrastructure that that is really a challenge in such a rural region as what we have up here uh, in in Michigan. Uh, yeah, maybe Sean and 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 others can. Say well, I, I was waiting for Joe to jump in, but um, <laughs> go ahead, Sean. Well, I don't want to step on Park Service toes. Um, it, the 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 challenge on our end is that this is America, and Americans care about America, and so making world heritage arguments is difficult when we're more concerned with national stories here. Um, and sorry, Joe. You can you can defend the park service after me, but that's the that's the truth. So getting having buy in to jump over the national story to world heritage story to connect to work to cooperate is I would say the big challenge here. Um, and then of course we are also overrun with visitors. We have infrastructure challenges that we're dealing with um, here um, as this becomes a quote unquote, climate refuge and things. But as people come here, this place is seeing tremendous growth and will continue to. We have an opportunity to reach out to all these new residents and visitors and get their buy-in. And once we have that buy-in, then we can, we'll be able to look outward, I think. Um, we're like, we're just, we're really on the cusp of big things here in the Keweenaw, uh, big changes, scary changes, exciting changes. Um, but with that, maybe there'll be changes in perspectives as well, um, and, and, a, and a, a turning outward and looking for the connections. You know, we have a, a strong Finnish heritage in this area, and they seem to have no problem looking outward towards Finland. The, the Finnish consul general or something was just here two weeks ago. Um, and the Finnish American Heritage Center is located here in on the Keweenaw Peninsula, and they refer to it as the Smithsonian of American Finnish Heritage. You know, so we have a template for how to do that cooperative work with that nation. And now this area just needs to, to find ways to look outward across the across the ocean to Cornwall as well. I don't mean to cut in on Joe either. So if you want to say something instead of me, go ahead. But when we left Cornwall the last time, and I've been there 10 times, so, you know, it's it's been fun and I've really enjoyed it. But when we left, I think we talked about it a little bit and there are so many parallels, not just in, her not just in the national park and, and the heritage sites, but in other things, that we can, we we talked about it and we said, you know, really, we all, we could both learn from each other, but we need to learn about each other first. And we tend, I don't mean to knock Americans in any way, shape or form, but we do tend to be, to be, we, I think because there's so much to deal with around us, you know, it's a huge country and it's it's hard to know everything about it. But we also tend to be kind of, I don't know what exactly the word is. My daughter who lives in South Africa had said to me, told us one day, she said, do you know what, do you know what it means to be, do you know what it's called to speak five languages? And, okay. <laughs> Quintilingual, four quadra, three, tri, two, duolingual, one, American. We need to get beyond that 
but we can do that because at least theoretically we speak the same language. Now there's a lot that, that isn't quite the same and we can learn from that too. But I, I really do think that was a bit of good advice that we need to learn about the place, the different places, both, both sides of the pond so that we can learn about and then from, if that makes sense to you. And if I could just add to that, you know, I think um, kind of like what Mark was, was saying, when I went to uh, Cornwall, I was expecting more of a, the partnership network that we have here. And that, to me, it was a bit of a surprise to, to see how loosely um, the sites seem to reflect or uh, work with one another. And that was, that was one of my big takeaways, but kind of in response to to what Sean was saying, you know, this this is, um, you know, the National Park Service. Um, we are uh, we are um, managed by laws, you know, and we are funded by taxpayers, and so uh, by by Congress. And so we have a responsibility to our um, audience, which is a lot, um, mostly I guess American, if you will. And so our interpretive staff want to make Americans care about places and so for a lot of our visitors that means reaching out to you know our internal audience that said you know I completely agree that it's uh, international partnerships and learning from other sites you know, like like in Cornwall that really helps um, historians you know and other researchers in the National Park Service provide content for you know our ranger staff to Build that awareness and appreciation within our visitors. It's a complex. It's complex, but you know, I know uh, there's a lot of transatlantic studies happening, and I'm really, I'd be really excited to get on that, um, do more work with that with other history colleagues in the Park Service. Um, but it's uh, it's not easy, you know. When when Congress tells you what to do, you kind of have to do it. <laughs> so it's how do we push those boundaries, and how do we how do we continually push to look beyond? Because that's that is key. Can't keep looking inside all the time. Lots to think about there. Thanks so much, Joni. You've got your hand up. Hi, I'm going to start my video, but um, it might all go wrong because my internet connection is a bit rubbish. Um, yeah, no, I was just, I was just thinking something that you said, Mark. Um, but has, you know when you've got those things that are bouncing around in your head and it's not until somebody says something that all of a sudden the connections just go together and it's like, oh yeah, that. Um, but what, what, and I was just having one of those moments when what you were saying, because, because I, so you were talking about public transport and you were talking about how you'd love to have the kind of public transport that we have in Cornwall, which we really hate. We think that it's rubbish. Um, uh, and, but then, you know, everything is relative, right? Um, it is rubbish if you compare it to like the city. Um, but um, so so you were talking about the infrastructure and about the kind of like different kinds of infrastructures and stuff like that. And it just got me thinking because um, uh, thinking about how different you know, how how different places evolve. It's, it's like you know you put the same you have the same culture, but in two different places in two different contexts with different sets of influences and all of those kind of stuff. And about how that same culture um, adapts in very very different ways with different influences. Now that might be complete rubbish, but um, but also it's just got me thinking. But I don't know, so I just thought I'd drop it in there. I th it feels right now it feels like that's a thread that would be quite interesting to explore and unpick yeah certainly I I, I don't know if there's a question in there or not but um yeah I I, I agree with you uh, I'll just say that Uh, watching the chat also. Um, hi, Sove. Um, Sove is asking, apologies if you've mentioned this, I don't think we have. Um, she's interested to know what connections you have with other Canoic Cornish diaspora communities, for instance, in Mexico, 
or New Zealand. Um, do you guys have any sort of partnerships or connections that you maintain in those places? Um, yeah, probably the only connection that you can really say that we have, the Keweenaw Care New Lake, um, we do have a connection with the Cornish American Heritage Society, which goes across the US and Canada. I don't remember that there was much connection with Mexico, but um, we did have, at our first gathering, we had people from Australia here, so that was interesting. Um, I, I don't think that really answers your question though, because they're not with specific communities. I know that, I mean, I, I don't know of any thing this, uh, of those kinds of connections, but I, this whole time that we're sitting here and then looking at one of the, the recent comments in the chat, there's this third peninsula that's developing at the same time that the Keweenaw is with heavy Cornish influence and that's down in South Australia. And I just, okay. I feel like that's, it's almost like there, there needs to be a three-way um, peninsular conversation there because they're all roughly the same size um and and you know at least in terms of the Keweenaw in South Australia they developed both from the 1840s and kicked on one had much heavier direct influence architecturally culturally uh in South Australia for sure um and, and it'd be interesting to look at why and the differences beyond just the colonial links but other other uh, links there as well you know, one connection that I don't think has been mentioned is the connection between the Cameron School of Mines and the Michigan School of Mines, because they were almost founded at about the same time. Um, I'm trying to remember where somebody did a comparison. I, I don't remember. One of the advantages of being old is you can forget things and no one ever thinks it's okay. <laughs> well perhaps that will be a, a topic for another day um it's been such an interesting evening so much more to think about than you know we've talked touched on so many different different elements and angles to explore and opportunities for the future um oh zoe says she's just come back from scotland where the public transport is streets ahead <laughs> oh, I think I just saw a wave from John in Toronto. Hi, John. Yes. Hi, thank you. Sorry, I missed uh, uh, most of this. But uh, talking about links, uh, the the Toronto Cornish were very active in going to the gatherings. And, and so you may remember uh, the gatherings in the Upper Peninsula that we had. Uh, we had quite a contingent along at that time, John Tyack you might remember, right. was one of them. Uh, I've inherited the the library from the Toronto Cornish, and, and I do find in there a, a bunch of, a number of books on the Upper Peninsula. John did his massive research study on the Bruce Mines, mm -hmm. uh, which is just across the border. And I, I'm sure he must have related that to the, to the miners who left uh, Canada and then uh, came across and slowly worked their way through wherever there was a hole in the ground. So I, I don't know if you had an opportunity to, uh, I'd asked uh, jo Joni if she could mention that I do have these books. I also have these, uh, what were they called, share certificates uh, from both Quincy Mines and the Central Mines. I don't know if these would be of interest or if you have anywhere where they would fit into an archives. They're in my basement and I'm worried about the long-term uh, survival of this material. So if there is a way, uh, if you do have a location there where I can I can pass this on, I would be very happy to. Uh, but I'm just, with, to the question about links, um, we, we haven't twinned as the Toronto Cornish, and you can imagine uh, there weren't many mines in Cornwall, in Toronto, so that we tended to get the, 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 uh, the, the wheelers and dealers and businessmen would come to, to uh, Toronto. Um, so we, we haven't had any links with other places, 
although we are starting to build because uh, to my surprise we we uh, Ontario was really quite a hotbed in mining and of course the hard rock miners were the first ones to come across in Cobalt where the silver mines in Timmins um, Kirkland Lake uh, were just areas that I'm, I'm now discovering we had the miners in in Ontario but this is this is very much new to me so I'm waffling on a bit but but I just I wanted to welcome uh, the gang to Cornwall and and Kate will know why I'm listening to this <laughs> <laughs> and and it's been fun working with you all. Oh, lovely, John. Um, sorry, Joe, if you're just about to jump in, has a message to say that there is a park archivist that you could get in touch with, um, and I've copied the email down, so I'll send it to you. Oh, thank you. If that's if that's probably a helpful thing. Yes, thank you. Um. And yet, yeah, apologies, you did mention about the books and I forgot to say so, so apologies for that. Uh, oh, seven pounds a day on the buses in Kerno now, just public transport creeping up. Um, I saw I saw Gage appear briefly and I didn't know whether that was a preamble to, to, to a question or a, or a comment. Um, if so, it would be lovely to hear from you, but uh, I feel that we are heading well beyond our target of eight o'clock, but that's only because we've got so many interesting things to say to each other. Um, so unless anybody has anything burning that they would like to say or ask of these four brilliant speakers, um, a huge thank you to you all. Um, I'm sure there'll be many more conversations to be had in in days, weeks and months to come. And... Joni, is there anything you wanted to say before we sign off for the evening? No, uh, hang on, I'll stop my video again. Um, just thank you, everybody. Um, a massive thanks to everybody who participated. I have so enjoyed, I, I personally, I don't know about anybody else, but I personally have so enjoyed this um, this evening. It's been really, really fascinating. Um, thanks everybody, um, Jean and Sean, Joe, Mark, um, for, for putting this together it's I've I love how you put it together as well it's it, it's felt like there's a really nice thread from kind of like the past present and also the future as well um and uh, very much looking forward to working um uh working with you all in the future and Kate thank you so much for chairing so so wonderfully um you've been brilliant cheers Oh, and thank you everybody else for coming, without whom we wouldn't have such have had such a lively discussion afterwards. We will be, we are putting on more of these, so uh, uh, watch out for them. Thanks for the opportunity to be part of this. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it feels really awkward now, doesn't it? We've all been, we're all doing <laughs> lots and lots of mutual appreciation society thank yous. Well, I'm, I'm sure it will be recorded. Um, Kate had noted this will, will have been recorded and will turn up on your website. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, oh, I should also say I'm going to put down my email address. Or, um, uh, I should also say if you'd like to go on our um, Institute of Cornish Studies mailing list and you're not on it already, um, send me an email and you will get regular-ish updates as well. So the best way, so my email's in the chat, just send me an email and I'll pop your email on, um, on our mailing list. Um, uh, the, our Facebook page, so we've got an Institute of Cornish Studies Facebook page. If you search it on Facebook, it'll come up. <laughs> um we should uh, that's probably one of the best ways of kind of like finding out what's going on um or a lot of the events that we're putting on within the institute um and we we we're a bit sporadic on twitter at the moment but yes the recording of this will go on to our youtube account soon um just these things sometimes take a little bit longer than we might like to but it will be up there eventually
Excuse me. Feel free to carry on, everybody, but um, I there's a hand up, so I feel a bit low to end it without addressing the hand. I'm not sure who it is, sorry, because you're you're noted as iPhone, so if you could introduce yourself. Oh, really sorry. Uh, Mike Aguirre and Gear. Um, so I, I was trying to put my sort out uh, my name on uh, my screen, but uh, I, I just couldn't work it out. <laughs> it was so frustrating. Um, and sorry to end this on on a fairly serious and somber note. Um, but I think it's it's a question which uh, is so important that you know I'm going to risk I'm going to risk um, spoiling everyone's evening <laughs> um, because returning to Cornwall uh, three years ago I'm a secondary school teacher um, and because um, uh, schools in Cornwall don't really teach the subject that I teach I teach Mandarin I'm a qualified Mandarin teacher which is all very good, well and good in London home counties not so much in Cornwall but I really wanted to come back to Cornwall um, so had to kind of make that decision um, but it did um, put me in a position where I had to do supply and I therefore went into schools throughout Cornwall and one of the things that I discovered is that not only as we would expect not only do our children um, here in Cornwall um, have a super superficial knowledge of the Cornish language but they're also not being taught um, Cornish history um, they uh, a lot a lot of uh, our young children with very typical Cornish names don't even know that they're Cornish. And even if they do know that they're Cornish, they ident identify as English. Now, this, and this is, the, the, the indigenous Cornish are now a rapidly diminishing. Oh, sorry, I've got an incoming call. Um, Oh, I think we've lost him. Um, sorry about that. It's a shame we didn't get to hear the rest of the question. But um, just my thoughts on where he might have been going with that. There, there is actually an interesting initiative now at Cornwall Council, if anyone's interested to find out about this, called the Curriculum Canoeic. Um, and just for your interest, um, Cornwall Council has been developing a curriculum that can be delivered in schools in Cornwall that covers the content that is mandated through the national curriculum, which has to be delivered through state schools in the UK, but making that content or articulating that content through a Cornish lens so that we as children learn about the things that we need to learn about as we grow up, but we understand more about the place where we're growing up as we go. Um, so. I, I would have liked to have heard the end of that conversation, but I don't. I don't think we will. But that's where I thought that was going to be my response, in case anyone was wondering. <laughs> shall we? Shall we draw it to a close <laughs> and all keep in touch? As I'm sure we will. It's been a fantastic evening of discussions and presentations. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Joni, for being so nice. I hope I've done a good job steering us through and um hope that we'll all speak again soon thank you thank you Bye. good night everybody Bye -bye. good night do you know what curriculum you need